Hi, my name is Mike Cheney and I'm a respiratory therapist and today I'm in the ICU with a ventilator and we're going to talk about a broad overview of mechanical ventilation. Nothing fancy, just an intro for those of you who are just beginning and want just some general information about the ventilators and how we use them. So the first place to start is looking at what we're doing right now, how we're breathing. And if you think about it, we're all breathing a certain volume, uh, which is called tidal volume. It's the amount that you breathe in and out with each breath. We're all breathing a certain number of times per minute, which would be referred to as respiratory rate or frequency. And we're all breathing a certain oxygen level, which room air is around 21%. And uh, of course, you know, we could add oxygen to people if we needed to. Um, that's called fraction of inspired oxygen, or FiO2. And again, room air is 21%. And we're all breathing in at a certain speed, whatever is comfortable for us. You can breathe in quickly or slowly. Now, if someone were not breathing effectively, or maybe they're not breathing at all, what you could do is you could grab a manual resuscitation bag and you could provide uh, ventilation and oxygenation for them. So, put a mask on the bag, put it onto the patient's face, get a good seal, position the head properly, and we can deliver a certain volume, a certain number of times per minute, at a certain speed, and a certain oxygen level. So if I didn't have this hooked to oxygen, we could ventilate them with room air, uh, but I do have it hooked to oxygen and it's filling up this reservoir bag now. So in this case, we would be delivering about 100% oxygen to the patient. Now, one of the big take home points from today is always remember is that if you are ever unsure that your ventilator is working properly or that your patient is not being ventilated properly, you can always disconnect them, grab your bag, your ventilation bag, and you can actually ventilate and oxygenate the patient while you troubleshoot the ventilator or uh, get one of the RTs to come and troubleshoot it. So it's kind of a comforting thing that you always have this in case you're unsure what's going on with the ventilator. And with any endotracheal tube, airway, or trach, uh, this will fit any size. So no matter what the size of artificial airway, the connector is always the same size and it'll fit that. It's also the same size as the connector on the ventilator. Those are the same, so uh, interchangeable. And they all basically do the same thing at their basic, the basic function. The ventilator does lots of really cool, uh, fancy things, but really it pushes air in and lets air out. This pushes air in and lets air out. So always can provide the basic function there. Let's talk about indications or reasons for why we would put somebody on a ventilator. If you think about normal lung function, uh, it serves a couple purposes. One, it mechanically moves gas in and out, and uh, we think of that as ventilation. And it's as, this is where CO2 is removed, which helps maintain uh, pH within a normal uh, range, but it's they also oxygenate. They bring oxygen in for the cells to use. And so there is a certain amount of work required to do that. And, and there's lots of things that can affect that. Um, and some people have lung disease, some people have acute situations where they can't keep up with the body's demand. And so what we do when we put somebody on a ventilator is we essentially take the work from them. We unload the work off of them, the work of breathing, and place it on a mechanical device, the ventilator while we fix whatever's wrong with them or their body heals, and then we load the work back onto the patient. So the ventilator can do all of the work or it might just do part of the work. And we'll talk more about that later. So the first indication or reason would be uh, something that should make total sense and that's apnea. If people aren't breathing, then we gotta put them on the ventilator. Second reason, and I, I will say, depending on what book you're reading, these can be listed all different ways, but they all kind of mean the same thing. Uh, so my list doesn't necessarily match uh, somebody else's list, but it all should be covered. 
Okay, so respiratory failure, uh, we have ventilatory failure, in which case they're uh, unable to move gas in and out effectively, and their CO2 is going up, which is lowering their pH, and they're just not thriving uh, in that sense. There are numerical criteria. Uh, you know, some, it depends again what you're reading, but when the CO2 you know, goes above 50 or 60, and the pH drops down to 7.30, 7.25 or below. There's some gray area in there and some, some opinion for sure. And like I said, differences in different sources, but uh, that's when they start thinking about needing to provide ventilatory assistance through a ventilator. Second category is oxygenation failure. And again, lots of different definitions of that, but basically if you have somebody on a lot of oxygen, uh, you know, a, a above 60% FiO2 or pushing 100% and they're not oxygenating well and it's something that you don't think you can turn around really quickly, then we would consider that oxygenation failure and we might need to put them on a ventilator. Third category is impending respiratory failure. So this is where you have not necessarily the numbers uh, are, are not showing ventilatory or oxygen failure, but they're just working really hard to, to maintain what they have. Their CO2 and pH and oxygen might be even in the normal range sometimes, but they're just working too hard. And we know we can't turn that around quickly. And we know that they're going to fail. Or maybe their numbers are not out of range yet, but they're trending that way. That, that would be... Uh, what would fall under the category of impending respiratory failure. Impending means it's about to happen. So we just go ahead and put them on the, the ventilator before the, they do fail. The last category kind of covers everything else. This is called different things in different places, but if somebody is comatose, uh, unable to protect their airway, uh, hemodynamically unstable, these are the patients that we're going to put on the vent uh, for those reasons. And we'll just just uh, lump them into that. So when we have somebody on the ventilator, we always need to consider the negative effects that the ventilator and the positive pressure that we're putting into the chest may be causing our patients. So I'm gonna go over some of the major categories of um, negative effects of mechanical ventilation and positive pressure ventilation. First category is barotrauma. The word barrow means pressure. So that's simply pressure trauma. And uh, I'm gonna talk about this later in the video where to find ventilating pressures. But basically uh, this refers to keeping track of the amount of pressure it takes to deliver a volume of breath. And there's a number that we can look at on the ventilator. And when those ventilating pressures start creeping into the forties uh, and that's in centimeters of water pressure, uh, then we start, we need to start looking at maybe tweaking some things, looking for why the pressures are climbing. Uh, is the resistance increasing? Is the compliance dropping? Do settings need to be changed a little bit? Um, and then not everybody looks at plateau pressure, but if you are one of those that looks at plateau pressure, you want to keep those less than 30 to reduce the risk of barotrauma. And once, you know, somebody has barotrauma, uh, then we tend to start looking at, you know, the patients getting a pneumothorax, pneumomediastinum, subcutaneous emphysema, all those things that uh, air leaks inside the body causes. Next category is volutrauma. And this is basically, I mean, you would think that volume and pressure go together and they do, but if you have a really compliant lung, uh, or one that's got a very weak wall to it, a very compliant lung we would see with pure emphysema, that lung can easily over distend at lower pressures. And uh, same outcome, it can, it can break and cause the same things as barotrauma, uh, but that's basically from over distension, over stretching, exceeding the, the lung's elastic capabilities. Next category would be what we call adelect trauma. 
And if you're familiar with the word atelectasis, uh, it, is, it means that it is not inflated. So we have areas of lung collapse, and this happens with disease processes. There's several causes of atelectasis, but how it causes trauma is that if you have a super stiff atelectatic, uh, very stiff lung, what happens is when the patient exhales, the lung can collapse. When we exhale normally, the lungs stay a, a little bit distended, a little bit open, uh, even when we're done exhaling. But in the case of atelectasis, uh, it, it will tend to collapse. And then when we push a breath in, it kind of you, it has to use a lot of pressure to reopen that lung. Kind of like if you let a, a balloon deflate and you try to blow it up again, there's that kind of really tough beginning part. And then once you cross over that, it gets easier. Well, when you have atelect trauma, the, the alveoli will collapse and then the ventilator has to use a lot of pressure to overcome that, to reopen it. And when you have a big difference in the exhalation pressure and the end inspiration pressure, it, you see you allow it to collapse and kind of rip it open, collapse, rip it open. Uh, it will tend to cause um, a lot of problems, inflammation and in units that are not equally inflated, um, which can happen, you, know, you have some diseased units or collapsed units next to ones that aren't quite as bad. And what happens is you over, since gas wants to go to the path of least resistance, you tend to over distend uh, some of the units and not open other units. And if those are next to each other, the distendable units will uh, kind of create like a hinge on the collapsed ones. And when that happens, just like if you keep folding a paper clip back and forth, it will eventually break. Uh, that's what will happen in the lungs. And I'm gonna show you a video of that. Next would be what we call biotrauma. So this is basically inflammation in the lungs, uh, can be from disease processes, opening and closing the lung units like we just talked about with atelect trauma, just creates this inflammatory process and uh, infiltration of the lung units. This is a great picture of what we've been talking about. These are rat lungs that have been exposed to 45 centimeters of uh, pressure. On the left is what they're supposed to look like. Then in the middle, that's after five minutes of 45 centimeters of pressure. And so they look smaller because they've got some damage, some atelectasis, some inflammation going on. And then on the right, after 20 minutes, you've got massive inflammation, uh, hemorrhaging, and a lot of damage going on there. So you can see it's really important that we keep an eye on those airway pressures uh, because damage can set in very quickly. And these are pig lungs. Look on the right, that's got uh, the atelect trauma going on, uneven filling, uh, probably paper clip effect. One's on the left, normal lungs, just inflating and deflating all together without collapse, they're all uniform. That's the way it's supposed to work. The next category we'll talk about is infection risk. So there's lots of reasons that patients on the ventilator will have an increased risk for infection. I'm gonna cover the major ones here today. Uh, the first reason is that when patients have an endotracheal tube going down into their lungs, it goes between the vocal cords and therefore the vocal cords can't close to create an effective cough. We also have this system that's naturally in our lower airways called the mucociliary escalator. And that's basically the system of cilia with a mucus blanket on top, the lungs secrete mucus and the things we breathe in, the debris, the pathogens, uh, dusts, all that kind of stuff gets trapped in the mucus. The cilia move it up to where we can cough it out. Well, there's things that will inhibit that mucociliary escalator. They include positive pressure ventilation, which the ventilator delivers. 
increased levels of FiO2 and the sedative medicines that we use on mechanically ventilated patients. So that system is inhibited by those things, among other things. So the mucus doesn't get moved out as effectively. That coupled with the lack of an effective cough uh, certainly puts our, our patients at increased infection risk. There's also this film that builds up on the inside of the tube. Uh, it's mucus and debris and bacteria, and it kind of just sticks to it and it gets thicker over time. And if any of that gets uh, dislodged or washed down into the airway, it can create an infection risk as well. Then there's just the poor distribution of ventilation that's inherent to people who are laying around with disease processes. When the ventilator delivers a breath, it tends to go to the most open parts of the lungs, which don't change a whole lot um, on the ventilator. So those are reasons for infection risk. Next is the cardiovascular effects, which can be minimal or they can be significant. And honestly, it depends on how compliant the lungs are. In a very stiff lung, when you push gas into the lungs, uh, into that stiff lung, it doesn't open up very much. And so it doesn't compress the blood vessels that are around the alveoli as much as a compliant lung. So if you have a super compliant lung, you push gas in the lung, the lung expands a lot and kind of pushes on the blood vessels around it. The capillaries around the alveoli tend to flatten. Uh, blood doesn't get pulled back into the heart from the vena cavas as effectively uh, when you push the positive pressure in there. So all of that decreases venous return, increases pulmonary vascular resistance, which results in uh, sometimes a lower cardiac output. And when that happens, uh, it can decrease kidney perfusion, which can uh, lend to some renal failure as well. The last category we'll talk about is intracranial pressure. Uh, because it's pushing positive pressure in the chest, we, you know, we've talked about the negative effects in other systems, but because it can inhibit venous return, if the intracranial pressure is elevated, it can the fluid backup can make it a little worse. Okay, so I'm going to show you how we hook the ventilator up on the initial setup. So there's three main connections. Uh, first, we've got to plug it in, and we always plug it into a red plug. That way, if the power goes out in the hospital, it'll be connected to the generator. And you might think that never happens. It actually happened a couple months ago. Uh, the lights kind of went down for a second until the generator kicked in and the first thing we did was run around and make sure all the ventilators were plugged into red plugs. Now, the ventilators do generally have a backup battery that will run for 30 to 60 minutes, uh, which is nice, but you certainly don't want to uh, have all the ventilators running on that and because you don't know how long the power is going to be out. So red plug always. Then we have our oxygen and air. So that's how the ventilator delivers a specific FiO2. So I have quick connects on here, so we can just go ahead and pop those in the wall. And now we're ready to go. So we always turn it on before we hook it to the patient. There's always a, a door covering the on-off switch on the ventilator because we don't want it to get bumped and turned off accidentally. So if you know a patient is coming, it's sometimes easier to get this thing at least powered up so that when they get there, you don't have to wait for this um, to power on. Okay, and every ventilator, there's lots of different types out there. Uh, they're all different, but they're all the same in some sense because uh, they all have some type of basic setup function uh, where you input the basic settings. And so now onto that screen, I can input all of my settings that I want for the patient. Which... Okay, before we actually connect our patient to the ventilator, we need to put in some initial settings. So let's go back to the beginning of our talk today. And we said that everybody's breathing a certain volume, a certain number of times per minute, and a certain oxygen level. 
And uh, so those are things that minimally need to be put in the ventilator. And those are things that need to be ordered. Uh, these four things here are the minimum that need to be ordered to run a ventilator. Um, so mode is something that uh, in the normal person who's not on a ventilator, all the breaths are their own. They're all spontaneous breaths. Spontaneous breaths are defined as a breath that, that uh, you have total control over. You are in charge of how often, how fast, uh, how deep, all of that. On the ventilator, we need to choose what type of breath to give and uh, how much of the work it's going to do. And so there are a lot of different modes on the ventilator. And that is definitely not in the scope of our talk today. Uh, I do have some other mode explanations on my YouTube channel that you can subscribe to if you're interested in that. Uh, but all of, the, all of the modes that are available uh, kind of were birthed from three kind of traditional conventional modes of ventilation. And those are the three that I'm going to teach you today. So again, these are the minimum things that need to be ordered to run the ventilator. Now, to be clear, just to remind you, this is a broad overview today. There are a lot of different things we can do with the ventilator and a lot of other settings we can put in. I'm going to talk a, a, about a couple of those later on, specifically PEEP and pressure support, but um, there are a whole world out there of really interesting things we can do with the ventilator. Okay, so back to the basics. We have to choose a mode first. And so we're gonna um, talk about the three conventional modes that are available. The first one is uh, called continuous mandatory ventilation, also known as CMV. This is also known as uh, assist control. Now there are some technical differences in these modes, uh, not part of our discussion today, but in this mode, let's say that um, we have a tidal volume, I'm just gonna use an example of 500 milliliters set on our patient. And we have the ventilator set to give that at a rate of 12 breaths per minute, okay? And just to finish it out, let's go ahead and put them on 100% of IO2. All right, so in this mode, continuous mandatory ventilation, also known as CMV or assist control, which is AC. Um, what that means is that all of the breaths are gonna be at the full tidal volume. Now, again, just to be clear, there are other modes uh, that work differently, but we're talking about a mode that is targeting to deliver a volume. So we're telling the ventilator, we're gonna deliver the set volume, in this case, 500 milliliters. So in CMV, the patient's gonna get 500 milliliters, minimum of 12 times per minute. They could be completely unconscious, paralyzed, whatever. They're gonna get 500 milliliters at 12 breaths per minute at an FiO2 of 100%. If the patient wants to take extra breaths, if they're able to do so, they can but every time they go to take in a breath on their own, the ventilator is going to sense it and it's going to deliver the full 500 milliliter tidal volume every time. So again, in CMV, that means that every breath is going to be at the set tidal volume in this case. Okay. 12 times a minute minimum. If they want to breathe extra, they can but it will be at the set tidal volume. The next mode is, it's called synchronized intermittent mandatory ventilation. And it is just what it says it is. It is mandatory ventilation, but it's intermittent, which means it's not every breath. So in, if we switch the mode to SIMV, and I'm gonna show you later on the ventilator how to do that. If we switch them to SIMV, they're gonna get 500 milliliter tidal volumes, 12 times per minute minimum. Doesn't matter if they're paralyzed, unable to take extra breaths, whatever. They, they're gonna get 12 breaths at 500 milliliters. 
Here's where it's different from CMV. If they want to breathe extra, they can. But if they initiate an extra breath, it is a spontaneous breath, which means it's totally on their own. It means that the ventilator is not going to push that 500 milliliters in on the spontaneous breaths. So to review, in SIMV, in this case, they're going to get 500 milliliters 12 times per minute. So uh, about every five seconds, if they want to breathe on their own in between, they can, but it's their own spontaneous tidal volume. Differentiate that from CMV where extra breaths are at a set 500 milliliters in this case, or whatever it's set at. And the word synchronized just means that if the patient, if it's time for a mandatory breath, one of those 500 milliliters, and the patient is actively inhaling or exhaling on a spontaneous breath, uh, the ventilator won't interrupt that breath, which is nice. Last one is called continuous positive airway pressure or CPAP. This can also be known uh, as uh, spontaneous and that's really descriptive. That's exactly what it is. It is completely all spontaneous breathing. Now you might think, well, why would we have somebody connected to the ventilator for all spontaneous breaths? Well, that's because uh, this is a this mode is good for weaning primarily. It has a couple other uses that uh, probably not in the scope of what we're talking about today. But the uh, it is really good for weaning, and we leave them connected because one, we can put a, a little bit of help on their spontaneous breathing. There's a, a pressure support that I'll talk about later that can give them a little extra boost. Plus, you get the FiO2 delivery and you get alarms, which if they get tired or, or disconnected or something, then uh, it'll let you know. So those are the three primary modes. So when we put somebody on a ventilator initially, uh, CMV or SIMV, either one is fine as a startup mode. It's just preference. Tidal volumes. Now, normal tidal volume on just a spontaneously breathing person is about five milliliters per kilogram of ideal body weight. On the ventilator though, we go a little bit bigger because we really want to inflate those lungs. So we're going to do six to eight milliliters per kilogram of ideal body weight. Okay, for example, let's say that we have a patient who is 70 kilograms of ideal body weight. Well, then their range would be, you would take the 70 times the six and the 70 times the eight, and that would be your range. So seven times six is 42, so that'd be a range of 420 milliliters to uh, eight times seven, 56. So that would be 560 milliliters. So that's the range, 70 times six and 70 times eight. A real quick way to do it though, is pick something in the middle. So if this were a real patient, I would say, oh, 70 kilos, I'm gonna go right in the middle. Seven times seven is 49, add the zero gives me 490 and I'm probably gonna round that to 500 milliliters. It's not an exact science. These are uh, just initial settings uh, based on you know, a, a range that, that might be reasonable. And, and they work out pretty good most of the time. So how you figure ideal body weight, there's a few ways to do it. And it gets a little complicated to do in a presentation like this. But point is, if somebody is reasonably close to their where they should be, you, you can go ahead and use their real body weight. If, they're, if they have a whole lot of excess body fat, then you want to think about using ideal body weight because uh, the extra body fat will change, you know, the weight will change your calculation here, but extra body fat doesn't change the size of the lungs. So we always use ideal body weight if, if need be. Okay, rate, we usually start at a range between 12 to 20 breaths per minute and FiO2 uh, it's real easy to start at 100% on somebody that you just put on the ventilator because usually they're pretty sick. There are some alternate ways to, to do oxygen delivery, but just as a real easy overview, 100% is really good. And then take it down as soon as you can. 
ideally we like to get people down to 60% FiO2 as soon as possible because it reduces the risks associated with prolonged time at high FiO2s, which can be a little bit damaging to the lungs. So those are the four things that we have to put in. There are some differences in different disease processes, but this is kind of the overview. Okay, so we've gone over the basics of mechanical ventilation and, and the settings that we put in and the different types of modes. So now I'm just gonna show you how to do that. So I've accessed the setup screen here after we started up the ventilator and I have a test lung here that I'm gonna hook it to. Um, but before we connect our patient, we always need to put the settings in. So we're gonna put the mode first. And in this case, I'm gonna choose uh, assist control also known as CMV, which we talked about. And so every breath is gonna be at the set tidal volume. And we're targeting volume here, which I didn't get into. Uh, there's a lot of other modes uh, that we can go through. And on my YouTube channel, I demo a lot of them. So if you're interested in some of the non-conventional uh, modes, you can access those videos if you're interested. VC Plus is one of the ones that uh, is frequently used. Uh, I got too close to the button there. Um, and pressure control, all those things, you can access those videos uh, when you're ready to go deeper. But basic conventional mode, assist control or CMV, SIMV, and then CPAP. So we're gonna do assist control first. We're gonna target volume. It means that every breath is a machine breath at the set volume. And so we're gonna go ahead and let's just put this at uh, 350. My test lung isn't very big, so I'm going to go with a small tidal volume, but normally you do six to eight milliliters per kilogram of ideal body weight. Uh, let's go ahead and do a frequency of 12. Remember, usual, usual startup is 12 to 20. 100% uh, oxygen, common to start on that. And then um, the flow we won't worry about that right now, but I'll set it at 50. That's a decent flow to start somebody on. So then I'm going to go ahead and hit start. And then now I'm ready to connect my patient. And we're off. So the first thing I want to do when I connect a patient is to make sure that the volume that I have set is what's being returned. So I'm going to look at this VTE up here at the top on every ventilator, there's a set portion and then there's what the patient's actually doing portion. So down here are the settings. Up here is what the patient is actually doing. So I have it set at 350. Um, actually, I think I have a little tiny leak at the humidifier because <laughs> it's, not, it's not totally connected, but um, you want to see that that is uh, totally uh, returning pretty close to what the set is. Breathe in 12. If this patient wanted to breathe faster, they can. And I'm just going to mimic that. You can see here. Now they're breathing in the 20s. The set is still 12 down here at the bottom. But that's what they're actually doing. So if you ever wanted to know how fast the patient's breathing, you don't want to look at the set. You want to look at the total. That says FTOT, that's frequency total. So make sure they're returning the volume. Make sure that you understand what the total respiratory rate is. Um, that's, what the, that's what the alarm sounds like. Just came disconnected there. Okay. This is our minute ventilation. That's the amount of gas they're moving in a minute. And that's their IE ratio, if you're interested in looking at that. Uh, these three are probably the most important right here, which is why they're the first three. Uh, this is the peak pressure. That's the amount of pressure that it took to deliver the breath. And so remember that when pressures get into the 40s or the plateau gets into the 30s, uh, we want to maybe find something else to do with the patient, a different setting, different mode tweak this or that to bring those pressures down because that's where we start seeing problems due to pressure. 
and actually I can feel a little leak right here in my lung coming out, which is where I'm losing that tidal volume. And my humidifier's got a little tiny leak in it too. So anyway, on a normal system, when you have a patient hooked to it, you'd want to make sure that that's pretty close to what you have set. If not, then you want to start looking for things like leaks and, and all that. Okay, when we want to make a change, we just touch it, make our change, hit accept. Again, every ventilator is different on how that works, but uh, they're all basically the same. Okay, now let's say that we want to change to SIMV. I would just do that, and I'm going to accept, and now we're in SIMV. Now what happens is they're going to get, in this case, I have the, the rate set at 14. They're going to get 14 breaths at the set tidal volume, which is supposed to be 350. And they can breathe extra, but if they do, it's going to be their own tidal volume. It's a spontaneous breath. You can see I'm triggering little breaths in here in between. There's a machine, that's the full set tidal volume. These other little ones, little squigglies there, those are spontaneous breaths. It's whatever the patient wants. So they can breathe as many times as they want. In assist control, they get full set tidal volumes, but in SIMV, they get set tidal volumes at the set rate, but anything in between is their own spontaneous breath. And just to show you that again, I'll switch back to assist control. Okay, now we can breathe over and you can see those are all full breaths. It's reaching the pressure. All those extra breaths. Once the ventilator senses that the patient wants a breath, go ahead and give it to them. Once we get everything hooked up and put together and the vent is turned on and we input our initial settings, we go ahead and connect it to the patient. And at that time, the very first thing we need to do is make sure that they're being ventilated. So the, what you do is you look at the exhale tidal volume, which is in the upper left corner of the screen, which we'll talk about later. Then once you've confirmed that your patient's being ventilated, go ahead and we set the alarms according to what the patient's actually doing. And then about, uh, well, it varies greatly, but anywhere from a half an hour to a couple hours later, we go ahead and get a blood gas and see how those initial settings are working for our patient. You have to be careful when you make vent changes. Um, a lot of people think you just make the change and hit, hit accept and, and that's the end of it. But it's very important to understand that when you make a ventilator change, very often it changes several other things that you need to be careful of. Um, for example, if you change the tidal volume, a lot of people think you just plug it in, you change it, hit accept, and that's the end of it. But really, when you change tidal volume, you're also changing the peak pressure, you're changing the I time, the E time, the IE ratio, the mean airway pressure, all those things. And so, again, very often when you make a change, it affects a lot of other things that you need to pay attention to. So, really, you should only be making changes if you are authorized to do that and you know exactly what you're affecting on the other things. Okay. So going back to, uh, we did assist control, we did SIMV, and now let's do uh, CPAP, uh, also known on this ventilator as spontaneous. It's the same thing. That just means that all breaths are gonna be spontaneous breaths. I was taking too shallow a breath there, the vent was letting me know. There's alarms on these. 
and these are set really tight so let me raise these a little bit and they won't go off so often okay so remember in spontaneous or CPAP Every single breath is a spontaneous breath, which means the patient is pulling whatever they want. I have to trigger every breath. If I don't, then nothing happens. It's all what the patient wants. So this mode is really good, again, for weaning. Now, it's a lot of work to breathe through the circuit. A lot of times patients are weak, deconditioned, especially if they've been on the ventilator a long time. So we, um, like to add what's called pressure support to any mode that has a spontaneous breath in it. And I'm going to switch us back to SIMV so I don't have to worry about keep on triggering the breaths there. Okay, so remember in SIMV, we're going to, in this case, this patient's going to get, let's go back to 350, going to get 350 milliliters 14 times a minute because that's what I have set, and then everything in between is spontaneous. Those are all spontaneous breaths. But again, we might want to help them out a little bit because as you can see, those exhaled tidal volumes are really tiny. So we have this thing called pressure support. And that's on here, it's shortened to piece up pressure support. And so we usually start pressure support at five. And it's easy as that to put it on. And what's going to happen now, they're still going to get their 14 breaths at the set tidal volume, the breaths in between are still going to be their own spontaneous breaths, but when they go to, to trigger a breath, the ventilator is going to give them just a little tiny inspiratory push of five. So patient is still in control, it's still a spontaneous breath, it's just giving them a little help, a little push. Kind of like, uh, you know, if you help somebody, like if you have a kid or you know, somebody that's having trouble, they're tired of walking, and you, you hold your, your kid's hand, and you know, you've been at the park all day, they're still walking under their own power, but you're kind of helping them a little bit. Okay, so, you can see on the spontaneous breaths here, now that's a machine breath. Now the little breaths, they got a little help. See the, the pressure, little pressure boost in there. And that does three things, pressure support. On spontaneous breaths only, it reduces their work of breathing. So when they breathe in, gives them a little help. It can slow down their spontaneous respiratory rate because their volumes are bigger. And it can help with work of breathing. So, improves the tidal volume, reduces work of breathing, and slows the spontaneous respiratory rate. Pressure support, we usually start it at five, um, and then raise it in increments of two to three. Usually you go from five maybe to eight to 10 to 12. Um, and that just helps them out a little bit. We like to see them return about five milliliters of kilogram per kilogram of ideal body weight on their spontaneous volume. So if you had a 60 kilogram patient, you would like to see their spontaneous breaths at at least 300. So you would adjust your pressure support. Although a lot of times we just start them at five and see how they do. So again, reduces work of breathing, slows spontaneous respiratory rate, and improves spontaneous tidal volume. So another one of the settings that is not required, but we pretty much always set, is called PEEP. And we talked about PEEP earlier, but I'm gonna show you how to set it. It's right here. It stands for positive end expiratory pressure. And we usually start that around five. If we need to go up, we usually go up in increments of, uh, two to three or sometimes you know a little bit more but 
generally small changes in PEEP, and that helps open the lungs up for alveolar recruitment, oxygenation, and it keeps from uh, the alveoli from collapsing on exhalation, so it can reduce the risk of trauma. So PEEP just kind of holds the pressure in there, and if we increase it, it'll hold more pressure in there, holds the lungs open even more. So that's how we set PEEP. Okay, I'm gonna show you the circuit here real quick. The gas comes out of the ventilator and then passes over a humidifier. Whenever we have somebody on a ventilator, we've bypassed their body's natural humidification system and that's some pretty dry gas coming out of that ventilator. So we pass it over some hot water. Uh, we have a water bag that drains into it and then it comes out of the humidification chamber and follows the blue tubing up to the patient. So that's where you connect to the um, airway or there's some things that might go before that like suction and things like that. So it comes in through the blue tube, then when the patient exhales, it comes out through the white. So gas only travels one way, otherwise uh, if it didn't, they would exhale uh, carbon dioxide into the tubing and then they'd rebreathe it. So we have fresh gas coming in through the blue and exhaled gas coming out through the white and that just gets sent back to the ventilator where it's filtered and measured so that way the ventilator knows a lot of information about what went to the patient. So that's basic uh, ventilator gas flow. Um, things we could put into the, there's lots of things we can bleed into the circuit. Um, we can bleed uh, in uh, treatment. This is a specific type of nebulizer uh, that we could hook in line and deliver nebulized medications. Uh, they also make uh, an adapter that you can hook an inhaler to and actually um, you know, give inhaled medications in through the inspiratory line there. You can also uh, deliver nitric oxide through the ventilator circuit. Uh, that's more advanced stuff, but I'm just kind of naming it. And so that's the ventilator circuit. Okay, so next we'll talk about monitoring and mechanical ventilation. On every ventilator, there's two main sections of numerical data. There's what's set, which is down here at the bottom on this ventilator, and then there's what the patient's actually doing up there on the top. There's a lot of data that you can look at on the top and what patient's actually doing. We could scroll over and see all kinds of stuff. But the main thing we want to look at are the first three here. First one is the peak pressure, and that tells you how much pressure it took to deliver the last breath. And remember, we want to uh, we want to do something about it as those pressures start climbing or if they hit into the 40s, that's where it gets a little concerning. We want to tweak some settings, try to find out what's going on, maybe change modes. There's lots of different things we can do. The next one is the exhaled tidal volume. And that's one of the really important ones to remember to look at because if you're ever wondering if your patient is being ventilated, you look at that. If they exhaled it, then that means they got it. And this should be pretty close to the set. Now, I happen to have a leak in my test lung, um, so it's not quite matching today, but normally you would make sure that it does. Up here is the total respiratory rate. And so we have a set of 12. If the patient wants to breathe faster, you see that up here, it's climbing, but the set is staying the same. So if you ever wanna know how fast your patient's actually breathing, you want to look at the total. And we have things like IE ratio, measured PEEP, mean airway pressure, minute volume, uh, but a lot of other things too, but those are the main ones. Okay, we're going to talk about alarms and decided to do those on a different ventilator. This is uh, one of the little bit older ones, but still see it around and you see it's basically the same kind of setup. Uh, screen is a little different. Here's the set data. Here's what the patient's doing. And then down here is the alarm menu, and that's what we're gonna focus on right now. So the first one here, every ventilator has a high pressure alarm, and that's the one on the far left here. And right now we have that set at 40. And the peak pressure is uh, around 22, 23. 
So what happens is if that pressure exceeds 40, it will stop the breath and it will dump it into the room. So that's the bad thing about the high pressure limit is that once it's hit, if the ventilator kept delivering the breath, then the pressure would keep going up and we don't want that. So once it hits that alarm, it will dump the rest of the breath into the room and the patient won't get it. So it's kind of a big deal when the high pressure alarm goes off. So you can set that. Uh, usually pressure alarms, they say, you know, if you want to set them tight, it would be uh, 10 above the peak. So we might set that at 30 or 35 and the low pressure would be 10 below. Um, or you could set it at the highest that you're comfortable with, you know, when you want to be alerted. Different places do it differently, but uh, in this case, you know, we set it at 40, that's fine. Because really, uh, I'm not too concerned about peak pressures until they start getting into the 40s, because that's when you really start getting some damage. Or if you're familiar with plateau, plateau is uh, a different pressure. It's uh, ventilator delivers the breath holds it in there for a second and takes a pressure snapshot after air stops moving. And uh, we don't want that over 30. But the peak, 40, uh, is, is okay. As peak pressures start climbing, you're gonna start looking for, you know, things that, that might be the cause. Um, you know, things in the way like resistance, mucus, it would include mucus, inflammation, bronchospasm, um, could be mucus plug, uh, patients biting the tube, it's kinking, they're too awake and they're fighting the ventilator. Those are all causes of high pressure alarms. And the most common probably is uh, they just, patient just needs to be suctioned or they're too awake and they're kind of fighting the ventilator. Cause of low pressure alarm would be a leak or a disconnect. So disconnects are easy because you can hear those and see them. Um, but uh, if it's just a leak, it could be around the cuff, could be through a chest tube, uh, could be something's got a little hole in it, something came loose. So always just start at the patient and work your way back and you look and you listen uh, to see what might be the problem. Next one is the high respiratory rate on this ventilator. So we have it set at 40. Um, yeah, it's probably good to set that. A lot of places just set it at, at 30. And so uh, if the patient starts breathing faster, you know, they're breathing 15 right now. So I'd want to know if they shot up to 30. You'd set it higher, of course, if they were, um, were breathing close to 30 anyway. You might want to set it a little higher. We have high and low minute volume. Um, e again, either set that at where you want to be alerted or uh, some places say set it, you know, three above and three below on the minute volume. And we have high and low tidal volume, exhale tidal volume for mandatory and spontaneous breaths. And so you just set those at whatever you want to be alerted at. Sometimes patients, when they're waking up, they're taking little tiny tidal volumes like after surgery. So you it, you know, if you have them like in CPAP, you might want to set the alarm a little bit lower on the exhaled tidal volume, but uh, generally on volume, they say 100 above and 100 below. But again, the tighter you make those, the more nuisance alarms you're going to get. So main thing, high pressure limit, something's in the way, something's blocking it, usually suction, uh, biting, kinking, uh, they're too awake, they're, they're asynchronous with the ventilator. Low pressure alarms generally leaks or disconnects. We've covered a lot of information today. And remember, this is just a basic overview of how the ventilator functions. And if you're interested in going deeper, I do have a YouTube channel that you can subscribe to. It uh, goes over a lot of the other non-conventional modes, but hopefully this was informative for you.